While we mentioned earlier, he has one of the best stories in NFL history, and he's still in the game now as an analyst. Also a great Twitter follow, by the way. You can catch him on NFL Network and Monday Night Football on Westwood One Radio, actually with my dad, Kevin Harlan. More on that aspect of it later. And I do want to pick your brain, Kurt, on some QB questions going into week one, but I want to get into your story. So first of all, thanks so much for joining us. This is really awesome. Oh, you got it. My, my pleasure. Well, I was looking back at kind of your start when you were named the starter, your second season, and really, who knows if any of this fantastic story would have happened if Trent Green never tore his ACL ahead of the 99 season, and boom, you're the starter. And we saw what your head coach, Dick Vermeil said in his press conference, the whole, we're behind Kurt, we're going to play good football. What do you remember him saying to you? Do you think they knew your potential? I don't think they had any idea. I mean, they... <laughs> They did a good job of, of hiding it because I think they were stuck with me. Um, I've actually heard some stories from some other guys over the years that uh, that the Rams actually did reach out to a couple of veteran quarterbacks. Oh. Now, did, did that mean to bring them in to be the starter? Did that mean to bring them in to be the backup? Uh, I'll let you speculate on that. Uh, <laughs> but I know that they reached out to some people. And, and again, I, I don't blame them. I mean, I – I completely understand. I think we always have to have a realistic viewpoint of other people's perspective on us or where we stand at a particular time. And, and I get it. Uh, at that point in time, uh, you know, Dick, when he, when he mentioned those words uh, in that press conference, it was through tears. Yeah. And so, you know, I always joke is that knowing Dick, obviously there's tears all the time. And there was, I'm sure, some tears for, for Trent. But I think there were also some tears like, oh, my gosh, we got to go with Kurt. Uh, because this was <laughs> This was Dick's third year, and you know the, the speculation there was that if he didn't win, he would be fired. He was on the hot seat. Uh, they were four and twelve, or we were four and twelve the year before. Things hadn't gone well. He was out of the game for almost a decade and a half. Everybody thought the game had kind of passed him by, um, and so I'm sure part of those emotions was, oh, really, is this the hand that I'm dealt? Like, you know, now I got to go with this guy. Uh, you know, and he's got to save my job. And so, you know, I think there was a lot of emotions and I'm not going to sit here and say that, that Dick, uh, it, you know, and some of the other staff didn't believe that I could play. I just think it was an unknown, an unknown. And I don't know if they, they knew it, I could play at that time. Like I was ready to be able to handle, you know, what was being laid on my plate at that particular time. But you know, to, to their credit, um, you know, and, and I'm very grateful that they did give me that opportunity. I knew when when I took over that the leash probably wasn't going to be very long, um, that I didn't know if I'd get one game or two games or until they found a veteran quarterback. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I knew that, you know, there wasn't going to be a lot of opportunities. If I went in and didn't play well, you know, early – you know, maybe I get a second start, but, you know, it wasn't one of these things like, hey, we're going to roll with you for 16 games if you're not playing well. So, um, you know, I think, again, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm thankful. There was enough belief there that they actually did put the ball in my hands. But, no, I don't believe any of those guys really knew what I was capable of or believed in me to the extent that they would later in the year. I just think, uh, hey, he showed us he can throw a football, and he's done some good things in the year that he's been here. Let's give him a shot, but, you know, we're not throwing all of our eggs in one basket. You just said you knew that the, or at least you thought the leash would be short. Were, was there a moment where you loosened up and you were like, ah, I got this? You know, the, the funny thing is, is that there was never a moment I didn't think I had it. Ah! That's the, uh, you know, that's the flip side of it all the time is that, um, you know, when you talk about my story, and I say this all the time, everybody looks at my story and they look at all the negative stuff. Ah, oh, he sat on the bench for four years. And again, they look at it now, obviously. Sat on the bench for four years, got cut by Green Bay, worked in a grocery store, played arena, you know, all these things that on the surface go, oh my gosh, this guy can't play. For me, all I looked at was when I was between the lines. So I played one year in college and I was the player of the year uh, in our conference that one year. I played three years in arena football. I was in the championship game twice uh, and, and voted the best quarterback in the league uh, those last two years I was there. I went to play in Europe for a year. Led the league statistically over there. So when everybody else was looking to go, oh my gosh, this is a guy coming from a grocery store. My mindset was, 
What do you mean? Every time I've played, I've been really, really good. And so nobody's ever shown me that I can't play. Yes, this is the NFL. Yes, is as good as it gets. But there was never a lack of confidence because I have never been in a situation with the ball in my hands where I wasn't successful. And so, uh, so you asked that question, and I, and I completely get it because – it's different and, and it's bigger and there's a lot of pressure. And, and as I said, you know, I don't know how long my leash was, but the bottom line is I knew I could play football. I, I knew that's what I did. And that's the one thing that I did really, really well. So I wasn't intimidated by, oh my gosh, I have to play it at the highest level. No, I mean, it's just, you're still throwing and, and reading and, and making decisions and, and playing the game that you've played forever. So I was very confident that I could play well. I wasn't, quite as confident that I would play like I did, um, you know, that first year. I mean, so many things came together and it was like a perfect storm. So I didn't know I would play at that level or up to that level, especially that quickly. But I did believe that I could play and that I was going to prove it to, uh, to everybody that I could play at that level. You've had all these years to think back on this. What do you think teams missed on you when you bring up the Packers cutting you early? What, but so many other teams missed on you too. What'd they forget? I don't think it was missing from the standpoint that see this guy and we don't think he can play. I think it was missing from the standpoint that I just never got the opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, I played one year in college. And so, yeah, I played really well that one year. But, you know, when you're looking at the landscape of college football, I mean, there's guys all over the place that played at bigger schools, that played longer, that had more success. And so, you know, I did get three or four opportunities uh, from a free agent standpoint, three three or four uh, offers to play uh, with teams when I got done. So it wasn't like, you know, nobody thought I could play. It was just, okay, one year division, you know, one double A school, smaller school. We got lots of other guys we're going to take first. Um, and so there just wasn't a big body of work. And then, you know, from there I went to Green Bay and Green Bay had, you know, Brett Favre, Mark Brunel and Ty Detmer. I mean, it's, it's a pretty good quarterback room. And, you know, I went there knowing that they only – they were only going to invite me to camp. So there was only four of us. So I went there with the mindset, well, you didn't have to beat one of these guys out, or maybe I can make the practice squad. Cause at that time, you usually kept three quarterbacks on the roster and one on the practice squad. So that was kind of my mindset. But again, there, I didn't really get an opportunity. I didn't play in a single preseason game. I didn't throw a preseason, you know, pass wow. that whole year. It was really just, Hey, we got these guys. We're happy with them. They're all healthy. They're not hurt. We don't really need to explore another guy. And so then, you know, it's arena football and it's Europe. And so I don't think it was people just looking and going, I don't think he's got it or I don't think he can play. I think it was just simply there's better options. You know, we've got a bigger book on more people that, you know, nobody ever really got, you know, got to see me play. And a lot of times we just say like in preseason in the NFL, you're like writing your resume. So even if you don't make the team that you're on, when you get to play in preseason, Everybody gets the tape. Everybody gets to see your throws. And like I said, I didn't get any throws. I didn't get a chance to showcase anything. So everybody else around the league's probably just thinking, oh, no, he was what we thought he was. He was a Division I quarterback that wasn't drafted and he didn't make the Packers. So, you know, what makes us think that we should give him a shot at that point? It's also amazing that you played in Amsterdam and you played on a team with another guy who ended up becoming – another amazing story with Jake the yeah. home did looking back did you guys reminisce about that or talk about that now going wow isn't that amazing we we did and uh you know we caught up about that you know Jake ends up taking his team to the Super Bowl uh, I got to play in three Super Bowls I mean Brad Johnson's another guy that played in Europe took his team to a Super Bowl won a Super Bowl and so um yeah we, we talked about that a lot um because for both of us, you know, we were, you know, looked at, looked upon it, at playing at smaller places and, you know, maybe couldn't play at that level. And so we were both trying to just earn our spot. Um, and it's pretty cool when you've got guys that um, that can play this game, that, that are really good at this game, but get overlooked. I think we're both just grateful that there was that league at the time. You know, I look back now um, and, you know, you sit here and, and – Olivia, you were talking about it. You know, if something doesn't happen to Trent Green, do we ever hear this story? Well, I would say the same thing. If there was no NFL Europe, if there was no arena football, kind of very similar to where we're at right now. I mean, I know there's a few smaller football leagues, but 
if there were though, there weren't those leagues for me to at least get a chance to play and be successful and, and kind of hone my craft, there's probably no story either. So I was so grateful for arena football and for NFL Europe at the time because I got a chance to get back on the field. As I said, no preseason passes in Green Bay. My tryout was NFL Europe to get back on the big field and show people that I could play. And the same was, was true for Jake. I'm sure Jake's probably thinking, seriously, then I finally get over here. And now I, I got to sit behind Kurt for a year. You know, it's like, when do I get my opportunity? And luckily he went back another year and went back, you know, the following year and ended up playing uh, the following year before he got his opportunity. So both of us reminisce about it. Uh, we're grateful to get to know each other at the time, but both grateful for the opportunity to actually play and have a league where we could parlay that into, a, uh, into great careers in the NFL. Well, the rest of your story is so incredible. It's documented in the movie American Underdog, the Kurt Warner story. I'm curious how involved you were in the casting of this because a game that layman people play all the time is who would play me in a movie? And Giannis and I were playing that in the first segment, had a lot of fun with it. Were you very involved in who was going to play you? I was not very involved in the casting part of it. You know, there's so many things that go into the casting, especially in the middle of the pandemic and COVID. Mm-hmm there were so many projects that were put on hold with the pandemic. And so there were a number of, of people that were scheduled to start shooting with different projects that just weren't available. And so a lot of it came down to, uh, you know, trying to figure out who your wish list was, see who might be available when we were going to shoot the movie again, as it fluctuated through COVID. And that became probably the biggest issue with it. But I say all that to, uh, to say, when, when you actually see the movie, the casting is awesome. I mean, the casting is incredible across the board. I, I think, you know, the people that put it together, uh, you know, our directors and Lionsgate did an unbelievable job with the cast, even though there were there were limitations, I suppose, from probably what their, their wish list might have been to begin with. But uh, I think everybody really hits the nail on the head, and we got some really, really great actors, and uh, I think people are going to be... Uh, People are going to love the movie. It looks like an amazing movie. Um, and, you know, the one requirement might have had to be the hair, no? That the guy who played you. Because yeah. I remember every time I watched you, you pulled your helmet off. Your hair doesn't move. You got, yeah. ni- you got a nice spiked flat top. Do you use gel or is that hairspray? <laughs> not a, not a hairspray. That's gel. But the real key was not my hair. It was my wife's hair. Yeah. That was the thing. Yeah is making sure that somebody could pull off the short hair uh, from the female perspective. So that was, uh, I think, more of the challenge than than the opposite. Uh, but again, exactly Levi, it's crazy. Um, you know, he looks very similar to me. I mean, there's yeah. definitely times when my kids even see scenes from, from different angles, and they're like, oh my gosh, Dad, it looks just like you. And so, um, you know, so there's so many different aspects when they – when they, you know, cast for a movie is, of course, the one thing we think about is who looks like us, right? But then there's the whole other aspect is that you got to take an actor and make them an athlete. Uh, you know, you got you to put them into that role. And that, that's, that to me is probably the bigger challenge than anything is, you know, when people go watch sports movies, um, you know, everybody is going to scrutinize everything. Like if I went into acting after, you know, 50 years, I'm sure I wouldn't be very good at it <laughs> after a few months. Uh, to put, you know, an actor into a role of being, you know, a Hall of Fame quarterback for a few months and expecting him to look like a Hall of Fame quarterback, that's probably not going to happen. But you know people when they watch the movie, that will be one of the crazy things that, uh, that they scrutinize because they, you know, for whatever reason, expect it to look just like uh, an NFL player. And uh, that's, that's probably the bigger challenge than finding somebody that looked like me and could play the part. Did you help coach him up at all, or did they have a football coach on set? Uh, both. I actually wow. came to the house, and, and we did a little bit of work. I only did a little bit of work. And, and ironically enough, they had a football coach that was actually a quarterback that played against me in the Arena Football League. Wow. Uh, I kind of coached him up and worked with him on a lot of the stuff and worked with him through through some of the different scenes. So, yes, they uh, they put a lot of time into to working with Zach. I'm not sure he got it 100% right. Uh, I still- <laughs> All the time when I see clips, like, dude, I told you you needed that. But, but anyway, uh, Zach, Zach does a great job. You mentioned your wife, Brenda. She has such an incredible story herself. Anna Paquin plays Brenda. How do you make sure that that story is told right and that you do justice by Brenda's story? 
you, that that's the challenge of you know this whole movie. And we've actually been in the process of, of making this movie for gosh seven eight years. Uh, wow. You know, shortly after I retired, and it was about getting the story right. We always said, you know, everybody always said, you know, your your story is made for the the big screen, blah blah blah. Yeah. But as we went through the process, you know, the bottom line for us was we just didn't want to throw a movie up on the big screen. We wanted to make sure it was the right movie. And for a long time, people couldn't just couldn't see the vision. I had a vision for what the movie would be for a long time. And a lot of people couldn't see it. We had a number of different scripts. And we just kept saying, no, this isn't it. This isn't where we want to go. This isn't true to what the story is. And so uh, a big part of that, Olivia, is, is as you're talking about, it's, it's not just my underdog story. It's the underdog story of Brenda. It's the underdog story of our son, Zach, who was injured uh, when he was four months old. And so that to me is the beauty of this film is that the backdrop of this film is going to be a football or a sports movie. The heart of this film is the underdog story of all three of us and our individual stories and then how together we accomplished what we accomplished. And so that to me is what's going to be so cool is you, you might go as a football fan or, or you might go because you know, your husband or your wife is a football fan and they want to take you. I believe everybody's going to be impacted, whether you're a mom or a dad or a husband or a wife, um, you know, brother or sister, whether you're a dreamer, you're a football fan. It has all these different layers to it uh, that are that are so cool. Um, I mean, again, we could go on and on. You know, the idea of making a movie in the middle of a pandemic. We were one of the first, uh, you know, studios that, that put together that in the middle of with all the testing and everything and to get a movie made the way that we did. The guy, the, the, the young man that actually plays um, my son, Zach, his name is Hayden, um, is actually got an incredible story too. He was adopted. He was left on the side of a street uh, and, and adopted uh, by his mom and dad. And he is, from what we understand, the first young blind actor that's played a significant role in a movie. And so there are so many awesome underdog stories in this movie that, as you say, most people probably won't know. They'll go into it going, okay, let's see Kurt's football story. And, yeah. and that, of course, plays out. But to have these underlying themes throughout is what I really think is going to impact people uh, and connect with them. And in the middle of the pandemic, when there's a lot of people that need some encouragement and some hope and find themselves I'll say in their grocery store moment where they're wondering how I got here and how do I get out of here and what does the future have in store? I just think it's really, really perfect timing and the story is done right that I just, I can't wait for it to come out on Christmas and, and for, for families to go together. And, and I believe everybody will be impacted. You got me really excited to see this movie mm -hmm. right now. I got a question. Uh, the trailer is unbelievable. It's online. People can watch. There's a scene I, when you're in the... You've only seen the, the behind the scenes. Ah. Wait till you see the trailer that will be coming out. The trailer is is really really good. So we've got we got more in store. We got more coming out. But but thank you for that. Yeah, it's amazing. There's a scene that they show where um you throw a a uh, a bag of bread uh, like in the aisle. Did that ever happen? Did that ch and also when you look at the Wheaties box, did you dream about when you looked at the Wheaties box you're like one day I'm going to be on this? Um okay, so first uh yeah, we threw things at the, at the store all the time. Um, and, you know, it was different things. I don't ever remember throwing a loaf of bread. But sometimes, you know, like in those grocery stores, they would have the end aisles where they would have different balls, like Nerf balls and stuff. So we would throw those all the time. But probably the, the thing that we did the most was, you know, each of us at night, we got our own aisle. And so we would have to stock our aisle. So what we would do is, is we would, let's just say I was in the candy aisle. So I remember doing this with M&Ms a lot is I'd crack open a bag of M&Ms and I would look to see, you know, where the, the other stockers were in their aisles. And I would, I would just throw them across the, the store and try to hit them with the, the M&Ms all night long. And so we would do things like that, where we were, you know, kind of throwing and tossing and, and uh, some of those different things. And of course, every once in a while, we would pick up something because everybody knew I, you know, my dream was to play football and that I played at U and I, and we, we, we would have a little game of, uh, of catch or a little game of football amongst the aisle, but it was, uh, yeah, it was always fun. So uh, that did definitely happen. And then Wheaties box. Yes, that happened too. I mean, I think growing up when you're, you know, when you dream of, of being an athlete, a professional athlete, 
that's one of your dreams. I always say that you kind of have a few checklists of you go, okay, I know I've made it win. You know, when you find yourself on Sports Center, you're like, okay, I've made it. Or when you find yourself on the cover of Sports Illustrated, you go, okay, that's another box you check. To be on a cereal box, and of course the cereal box was Wheaties when you were growing up, uh, was another one of those that, that I wanted to check. And so, yes, I remember, you know, stocking the shelves, and I actually shared the story uh, in my Hall of Fame speech about how, uh, you know, one day when I was stocking shelves, I pulled out the box and it had Dan Marino on it. And, um, and you know, and, and I remember looking at it going, gosh, you know, one day I, I, want, I want to be on the cover of this box. And I shared the story at the Hall of Fame that uh, five years later, uh, so at that point in time, Dan Marino was the only quarterback in NFL history that had thrown 40 touchdown passes in a season. So after sharing that story, five years later, my first season, I threw 40 touchdown passes. So I became just the second player in NFL history to have thrown 40 touchdown passes in a season and reflect back to, you know, so seeing that Wheaties box with Dan Marino going, one day I want to be this guy. And five, you know, five long short years later, mm -hmm. uh, I became the second player in, in NFL history to do that. So I shared that in my Hall of Fame speech. Dan Marino had never heard that, but uh, just kind of a fun way to, to you know, that you, you look back and you go, man, it's crazy how we get motivated sometimes. And, and you know, moments that really kind of shape our perspective and our mindset moving forward. It's amazing. That really is. You know, Kurt, I mentioned earlier that you call Monday night football games with my dad who has just such reverence for you as a person. He also loves you as a friend, but he told me a story last night. We're having dinner and I was telling him I was talking to you today. And he said, as you guys get ready for your Monday night games and maybe you meet, you know, Sunday night or you're having your zooms, he says that you are just a complete student of quarterbacks. And he said, he doesn't think you miss any pass that has happened over the weekend. So as you approach your Monday game, you've seen just about every play from every quarterback. Is that true? And why do you focus so much? Um, probably not by Monday. So, <laughs> but I've seen everything up to that point. So I watch every single game every week. That is my prep. And wow. so again, I, there's no way I can get them all from Sunday to Monday, but I've watched all the ones from the week before that lead into that next weekend. Um, well, I mean, the way I look at things is, is that I always feel like, how am I going to be different at anything that I do? Mm -hmm. You know, whether I was playing the game, whether it's as a father or a husband, my mindset is always, what's always going to set you apart is being different. And how can you be different at what you do? And so when you're playing, there are certain things that, that I couldn't do. There are certain skills that I didn't have. But I always told myself, well, if I'm going to be great, there's got to be something about me that's different. And I took that same approach when I got into uh, commentating the game as well, is that I want to be like everybody else. I don't want to just say what everybody else can say. Like I could show up on my Sunday morning show on NFL Network and I can answer all the questions like everybody else does all week. And I could say the same things and I could get through the show and I'd be fine. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be someone that knows what's going on, that studies the game, that can bring something different that everybody else doesn't see. You know, everybody else doesn't watch the games. And so it gives me a true sense of what I'm seeing, how somebody is playing, what a team likes to do, how they might approach playing against another team. And so that to me is how I separate myself, is that I watch each and every game and I take notes. Um, you know, there's even there'll be a handful of NFL quarterbacks that I'll take notes and send them notes wow. every single week on, on the film that I watch. And so to me, A, I love the game. I'm, I'm passionate about the X's and O's of the game. It's to me my favorite part. I mean, I love to compete, but X's and O's and, and thinking the game and what works and what doesn't work is something that I've always been passionate about. So that's one of the reasons. Um, the other reason I, is I just like to know where everything is and it's my prep uh, mm -hmm. for the week. It's my prep for Monday night to know, man, whoever, if the Raiders are playing, that I've watched every snap that Derek Carr has taken all year long. I'm not just listening to what somebody else says mm -hmm. or somebody that's close to the Raiders. I've watched every snap. So I know, uh, and I know, how, I know the game. I, I know what I'm seeing. I know what a quarterback should do and shouldn't do. And so it gives me a true assessment when somebody might say, Derek Carr's playing awful. And I'm going, no, he's not. They might not be winning. You know, the completion percentage might not be there, whatever. But I understand and I can think back to everything that's happened. And so, A, it helps me when I'm calling a game because I can reference 
all these different plays and things that have happened and how teams are playing in general. Um, but B, it helps me to, to work through, you know what I mean? Because most people are reading an article that's written by somebody or watching, you know, the, the quote unquote experts talk all week long. Mm -hmm. And all they're going to do is regurgitate what they've heard all year, all week. And there's nothing I hate more than when I've watched film and somebody says something and I know it's not true. And then somebody else a little later in the week says the same thing. Yeah. And then and I'm just like, how do three people decide that this is the case when I know it's not the case? Yeah. And you know it's only because they've listened to somebody else, so that becomes their opinion. I don't ever want to be that guy. Mm -hmm. I want to have my own opinions. I want to know why I have those opinions. I want to be educated on it so I can be the best uh, you know, color commentator or I can be the best studio guy that's out there. And so it's really, really important to me to, to work at it and to make sure that I'm different at it. And that's why, um, you know, I've kind of developed that over the years. And, and I don't really need a whole lot else. If I can watch every game um, and, and watch it the way that I want to, I don't really need a lot of prep for anything else. I know what's going on, and I can answer any question you throw at me. I'm a big Giants fan, Kurt. And, uh, you know, you, you go over the Giants, you win four or five straight. I can't remember. Then uh, there was a few mishaps. What was it – First of all, I think you probably could have won a Super Bowl with the Giants, but that's another thing. <laughs> what was it like with your story coming in to the Giants and then being the mentor for a highly touted recruit like Eli Manning? What was that like? Well, I mean, let's go back to the Rams first because I think so much of our lives, uh, who we become is shaped by our experiences. And so – as much as I'd like to sit here and say, well, without a doubt, uh, no matter what happened in life and whatever successes or failures I had, if I found myself in a backup role, I would handle it with class and I would do all the right things and I would mentor the young guy. But bottom line is I don't know what I would have done. But when I was in St. Louis, that's exactly what happened to Trent Green is he was a guy that just got his contract. He had waited his turn. He suffered this injury. And now – this young guy takes over and this young guy starts to have success. Um, without a doubt, just human nature, there's going to be some animosity there. Like, seriously, that's my gig. You're like, I'm supposed to be doing that. And he's doing that. But Trent did nothing but treat me with class, answer every one of my questions, uh, help me as much as he possibly could to be successful. You know, again, human nature, I'm sure, was in there. But he never let that affect the way that he – handle this situation in, in mentoring me. And so I say all that to go, I got to experience that firsthand. And so when you experience that firsthand and you realize what someone else has meant to your career, there's really only one way to mentor someone else. And that's to do it with class and to help them. And, you know, the thing that you have to realize and that I realize in the process is that too often in sports that when we lose our job to someone else, we blame the person that took our job. Like, shoot, every time I stepped on a field, I was trying to take somebody's job. I mean, yeah. I was trying to, to be the best guy on the field and win that job. And so when somebody else takes your job or beats you out or even just is given that opportunity, it's not their fault. I mean, like, you know, you would take it too. So to hold that animosity against that player um, just doesn't make sense to me. And so, you know, through going through what I did with Trent and, and experience it myself – it was really just being able to take a step back and go, what would you want somebody else to do if you won the job? You know, if they gave you the job, you would, wouldn't want them to hold that against you because we're all, you know, trying to compete for the same thing. And so that perspective helped me as well to go, man, my job, you know, when I signed on the dotted line to be a giant, there was no fine print that said, you just have to be a good teammate if you're starting. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have to do the right thing if you're starting. No, I signed on the dotted line to say I'm going to be a New York Giant until I'm not anymore. And my role is to be the best New York Giant and do the best that I can for this team, whether I'm starting, whether I'm a backup, didn't really matter. And so that really became my approach because I had to do it with Mark Bolger in St. Louis. I had to do it with Eli in New York. And ultimately, I would have to do it with Matt Leinert in Arizona as well. So uh, I was very seasoned at doing it. But that was really my approach. But – you know, again, I, I like to think that I would have done that anyways, but I had a great example in Trent Green that really showed me the way and showed me what you're supposed to do when you're in that role. And I carried that with me through the rest of my career.
Kurt, you mentioned your Monday night football schedule beginning with Baltimore at Las Vegas. Two very different quarterback stories there. Let's start with Derek Carr, who has more or less said he's going down with this ship. He is so loyal to the Raiders. And last year, he's coming off career high passer rating, pass yards, total QBR. What do you see in Derek Carr? What's his ceiling this season? All right, Olivia, this is where all the film study comes into play. Yep, here it is. Yeah. What I'll say is that uh, that I'm a big Derek Carr fan. I think Derek Carr, he doesn't get the respect that he deserves. He does a lot of really, really good things uh, on the field. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not a believer that stats and QBR and completion percentage tells the whole story. And so with Derek Carr, to me, is I think it's all about being aggressive with the football, is that I believe he's a guy that can make every throw uh, and has the ability and has had games the Chiefs games uh, last year, I think, are great examples. Mm -hmm. When he throws caution to the wind and says, I'm going to win this game for us or I'm going to lose this game for us, I'm going to go down swinging. I believe he can play as well as anybody in the league. I just think there's times where he gets really, really conservative with the football. And he's looking more for a completion than he's looking to make the game-deciding play in a moment. And we have quarterbacks like that, like – I don't want to be the one that loses it for us. So I'm going to manage the game and I'm going to do my part. But the quarterback position, you just can't win at the highest level to me just managing a game. Now, yes, if all the parts are right, great defense, good run game, yes, we've seen it before. But bottom line is, for the most part, that doesn't happen. So I tell my young quarterbacks all the time, you got to be willing to be the reason. If you're going to play quarterback in the NFL, you got to be willing to be the reason. you got to be willing to be the reason that you win. And you got to take those chances and you got to believe that you can do it. You also got to be the reason and be willing to be the reason that you lose. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to go down swinging. Sometimes you're going to throw five interceptions. Sometimes you're going to make a bad decision. But I always believe that if you were aggressive and you attack and you had the ability that you were going to make more game-changing plays than you were going to make game-changing mistakes for the most part. And that's what I want to see from Derek Carr. All the ability in the world. Does a lot of good things. I think he sees the field really, really well. But too often to me, he plays tentative football instead of playing aggressive. He plays aggressive. I think he has a chance to take this team to a place they haven't been in a while. But it's ultimately going to come down to him. Um, and that to me is, you know, and I, I know Dave, Derek. And so I'm always, uh, you know, trying to encourage him that when, when I see that on the film every once in a while, I'll just shoot him a text like, hey, be more aggressive. Or when he does play like that, I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. You play like that every week. And you'll give your team a shot every single week. But that, to me, is the one thing that I'm looking for with Derek this year. I was going to ask you that because you did say Very you nice. reach out to quarterbacks sometimes. So it's good to know Derek Carr is in your contact list. What about Lamar Jackson? How yeah. special is the talent that we see year after year from Lamar Jackson? I mean, it's, you know, it's <laughs> rare error. I mean, what, what he does... Uh, we haven't seen very many. We won't ever see very many that are like him, uh, you know, what he can do physically. You know, the Michael Vicks, maybe a Randall Cunningham type guy. But there's just there's just not many that, that we see that transcend our game because we know we, we've got the best athletes in the world playing on those fields every single week. Um, and then when you're the best athlete of the best athletes in the world, I mean, it's just – it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but, but the bottom line, you know, again with Lamar is I say to myself, he's an incredible athlete and he will have a great career and he will put up a lot of great numbers and he'll give us a lot of highlight plays. Um, but the bottom line, you know, with a guy like Lamar is that he's got to become a complete quarterback is that I believe what they do offensively is built for the regular season. It is built to win games in the regular season. It is built to beat all the teams they're supposed to beat. The difference is when you get to the playoffs, you've got to beat teams that you're not supposed to beat. Mm -hmm. You've got to beat teams that are good on both sides of the ball. You've got to beat teams that are going to force you because they're good enough to do, to play away from your strengths. And that to me is where Lamar hasn't got up to speed yet to be able to win games away from his strength. He will always win games with his strength. What he does, you give him opportunities, he will be special, but he's got to be complete. And for all of us, it's different. You know, there's certain things we do well, and then there's things we don't do as well. And good teams are going to take away what we do well and force us to win games the other way. And that's the question with Lamar is can he do that? Every time it's come playoff time and he's had to win games with his right arm, he hasn't been able to do that. 
That doesn't mean he can't throw the football. It doesn't mean he can't pass it. It's just championship passing is different than just being a good passer. Being able to carry a team with your right out arm is different from just putting up good stats. And that's what he needs to show us. Um, and, you know, I think what we know is that maybe for Lamar, he's not going to have to throw the football like me or Tom Brady. But he's going to have to throw it more consistently and better than he has to couple with that rare ability that he has to run the football. And that's what will make them uh, a championship type team. We just haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen him carry this team with his right arm. And until he does that, especially when you look at the landscape of things, because that's the other thing that you have to look at is, unfortunately for him, the Chiefs have Patrick Mahomes for a decade. <laughs> and so there's no getting around that unless for some reason Patrick's not out there on the field. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to take down Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs if you're going to win a championship. And you've got to show me you can play consistently enough to do that. And, uh, and so that's how you always have to look at the NFL now is that, Every year you look at, okay, who are the three or four teams that have a chance because they have a quarterback? And then which other teams need to take that next step to show that they can compete with that team? And I'm still waiting for that in the AFC. You know, I'm looking to say, okay, maybe the Bills. Bills showed they made some progress, but again, they went up against Patrick Mahomes and they didn't show up very well. So there's still a gap there. So I want to see if these teams can close the gap. And Lamar and the Baltimore Ravens is one of those teams. The success of a quarterback uh, is not just what he can do, right? Though it's 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 what you have around you, right? You were you were lucky to have such great wide receivers when that year you won it. You had Marshall Falk and yeah. the O line, of course. How important is the tight end? Which have, did you ever really have a great tight end? What do they call it? The quarterback's uh, safety blanket. Yeah, not never really had one of those, but I'm not going to complain because I played with like a dozen Hall of Fame receivers, so I'm, I'm okay in that regard. But you're right; I, I never played with one of those great tight ends. And you know, Marshall, I would be, I would, I would like him to, because to me, running backs and tight ends are the biggest mismatch in football. The way those guys play now, what they're capable of doing, the flexibility to go inside and play against linebackers and safeties, as opposed to the the other great athletes that are out there at the cornerback position. They're the biggest mismatch in football. And so uh, that to me, those, those guys are difference makers. It's like, like I said, I had Marshall Falk. So I got that advantage with Marshall was I would get him on linebackers and safeties and it, was, you know, it wasn't even fair. Uh, but now guys, you know, like the Darren Wallers and the Travis Kelseys and the George Kittles, uh, you just, I don't know how you cover them, especially if you're playing on a team that, that runs some play action. So now you're a linebacker that has to, you know, see your keys and read run. And then all of a sudden, oh, shoot, there's a 4-4 four, four guy that's playing tight end that just ran by me. Um, you know, I mean, it's just, it's unfair. And so having those guys um, are ridiculous uh, in what they're capable of doing. And so, yeah, that is a huge, huge benefit for a quarterback. I mean, A, normally you don't have to throw it as far with those guys, right? You're not having to get your big plays by throwing it way down the field. So it's it's shorter, it's easier completions for a quarterback, but it just gives you such a distinct advantage with those great athletes because of play action or because of who they're matched up against it. And um, that, you know, in this NFL, you look at those guys and say, if you have one of those, um, it gives you a chance to do some unique and different things that you don't get just having a great wide receiver, as great as that is, tight ends and running backs that are really, really good in the pass game. Uh, are, are huge for quarterbacks. Kurt, I wish we had time to run down each week one meeting and you could go over both quarterbacks in those games, but we don't have the time. You know, last week, the Patriots waived Cam Newton. So we know Mac Jones, the rookie quarterback, is going to start against Miami week one. Go ahead and give us something to look for with Mac Jones, because I know you were surprised by that. I was a little bit surprised. And I was more surprised, A, because, you know, I didn't think Bill Belichick would go with a rookie because he's had so much great success against rookie quarterbacks yeah. that I just thought to myself, no, he can't do it. Like he knows, you know, that there's, there's so many issues that you have to work through with a young guy that they'll at least sit him for a while. And then the second thing is I just thought based on the way that they were built, Cam Newton running the football, uh, I felt like this team, if they could establish the, the line of scrimmage would be a really, really good team again, uh, even in one year after missing the, the playoffs. So, that surprised me from a couple of different standpoints. But with that being said, um, you know, 
I break down all the quarterbacks and have been breaking them down. I got a platform called QB Confidential on YouTube where I, I do a lot of film study based on what I do and breaking it down. So I just recently broke down all these the five top quarterbacks because of what I saw in, in preseason. So what I was doing is I broke them down out of college. And the big thing that I'm always looking for is what translates from college to pros. You know, can these guys, what they did well in college, can they also do that well in the NFL? So when it comes to Mac Jones, what you saw in college was a guy that processed information really well, knew where he was looking at, uh, you know, looking at the defense and how to make those decisions. And he got the ball out on time and accurately. Okay, fast forward to preseason with the Patriots. All those exact things have shown up in the NFL. Knows where he's looking, knows when to get the ball out, makes good decisions with the football. If he's got to check it down, he's willing to check it down. Shows good accuracy. All of those things is what I've seen from Mac Jones. And so I'm excited to see him starting for the Patriots and, and what they can be this year because I do believe they have a really, really good football team. But that's the thing that always excites me is that we get all hyped up about these college quarterbacks because of what they do in college. Can that translate? I've seen a number of guys where it doesn't translate to the NFL. What I've seen in preseason with Mac Jones is it does translate. I think you're going to see a guy that plays the game very much like Tom Brady. You know, somebody that the Patriots are very comfortable with. Josh McDaniels is very comfortable with. So that would be very much their style this year, I believe. Um, and I think they'll win with, win with Mac Jones. Will they be a great team? I'm, I'm not sure. We want to see if, if that physical talent can transcend things because – all these guys can throw. That's that's not the question. The question is, can you transcend the game with some ability? You know, what is that ability? Leadership? Uh, is it, you know, the ability to be accurate? Is the ability to make plays off platform? That's going to be the question with Mac Jones, is, is what does he bring that's, that's different or special to allow him to be a championship quarterback? Uh, and that's what I'm waiting to see. But I really, really liked what I saw in the preseason. Everyone's excited to see the movie, and I know the movie is going to inspire everybody, but if or is there any advice you can give that's not in the movie to people who are undrafted, to players who are undrafted, or people who are in the underdog position? Like, What would you tell them? What advice would you give them to an undrafted player? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple things. There is, you know, the first thing is, is don't uh, let anybody else tell you what you are. Uh, I think that's, you know, the, the easy narrative uh, when you work in a grocery store or you get cut or you play one year in college. It's easy for people to just look at that and say, oh, this guy can't because he didn't in college or because he found himself here or there. And so that's the first thing, because you're always going to have that narrative about you when you don't get drafted, when you're a free agent, after you've been cut by one team. So don't ever let anybody else dictate who you are. And then the second thing is something that we, we talk about in our household all the time is never let your circumstances define you. Mm. Because, you know, again, in my Hall of Fame speech, I, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do while you're waiting to do what you're born to do. And I think many of us have had their grocery store moment, right? Many of us find ourselves in that place where we're just going, my gosh, how in the world did I get here? And then not only how did I get here, but what's the path for me to get from a grocery store to the Super Bowl? Like, how does that work? Uh, you know, you don't really know what it is. And so it's easy for us to allow those cir circumstances to start defining us and going, oh, my gosh, I'm in a grocery store. Oh, my gosh, woe is me. I, I, I'm not going to be able to do this. There's no path. And so that would be the second thing is just don't let your circumstances dictate, uh, you know, who you are and define who you are. Because most people find themselves there before they, they get to wherever they're going. Uh, before they, you know, they accomplish their dream. I think you could find a million people that, you know, we would call great people or accomplish great things in life that had those moments. That's what normal life usually is, is we find ourselves there and we got to find our way through it. And the only way to do that is to not allow that circumstance to define who we are and what we're going to be. Well, if that doesn't have you pumped up, Giannis, I don't know what will. I, that is such good content for our audience. Kurt, thanks so much. Oh, you got it. My you got us ready for week one. Thank Everyone, you, make Kurt. sure you check out QB Confidential on YouTube. You can find Kurt Warner on NFL Network and Westwood One all season long. Kurt, this was a real treat. Thanks. Oh, you bet. Thanks for having me on. Good stuff.